Well, welcome. Welcome back, everybody. My name is Nat Zappia. For those of you who have, have been to uh, some of these earlier webinars, I am the uh, director of the Institute for Sustainability at CSUN. Um, and I'm joined here with uh, Vaughn Savio, who I'm going to introduce um, in just a minute, and uh, Sarah Johnson, who's a, also the co-host, and uh, she'll be helping moderate some of the some of the chats. Any questions you guys have, I'll, I'll uh, as Yvonne is talking, feel free to type it in there, and I could, you know, I'll try to um, ask Yvonne for you and, and moderate some of the some of the thoughts or follow up questions you might have. Uh, Sarah is a program analyst at the Institute for Sustainability as well. Uh, so the institute has been around for 12 years at CSUN, and uh, and our goal is to to educate and to inspire and to really get the community. Um, thinking about sustainability and regeneration and uh, the future, but also uh, really getting their hands dirty and thinking about uh, how they could um, engage not just their local environments, but also their communities and, and each other and really get everyone thinking about sustainable practices, uh, whether it be through energy, consumption, food, uh, gardening, which we're gonna talk about today. So this is our third or uh, fourth um, session in, in this series. And we are deeply, deeply honored and excited to have the, the one and only Yvonne uh, Savio here today. Uh, I'm gonna just read a little bit of her bio and um, maybe just tell you a little bit about how, how we know each other and then I'm gonna have her uh, take it away. Uh, and so today she's gonna be talking about a, a lot of things, but particularly about container gardening and it, container gardening. And I think that for many of us here, this is particularly relevant because a lot of us will be gardening out of containers. We don't have um, farms or, you know, a lot of us just have a windowsill. So I think, um, and I'm one of those, a uh, little balcony where we have a little mini garden growing and it's all through containers. So so this is a, gonna be a very interesting uh, talk. So just a little bit about Yvonne. Um, Yvonne grew up on a three quarter acre hillside lot in Pasadena growing year round uh, fruits and vegetables and flowers with lots of manure <laughs> and compost. Uh, and making do uh, before it was called recycling or repurposing or sustainability. So Yvonne has been practicing sustainability for decades and sustainable farming and gardening for, for decades. Um, as she has said many times, she knows what harvested at the perfect moment of ripeness means and enjoys enabling others to enjoy the benefits of growing on your own or growing your own. For 36 years, she worked for the University of California, uh, working with uh, statewide uh, vegetable, fruit, and ornamental specialists. She then revitalized and really, um, as many of you probably know, has really, um, I mean, revitalized is kind of an understatement, really rebooted the, the, the mm -hmm. LA County Master Gardener Program, um, which is a, a volunteer program through the University of California, which um, trains gardeners to become garden educators and particularly for communities of need throughout LA County. Um, she, uh, in those 36 years, she taught uh, at least and many, many more um, in, in bio, it says uh, over 1100 uh, master gardeners, probably more uh, indirectly. Um, 1150 master gardeners who, who then and continue to serve the 1.3 million uh, LA County of more of that even, um, residents. Uh, since retiring in 2015, she continues to inspire gardeners making presentations and providing monthly tips and blogging on her website, uh, www.gardeninla.net. And maybe Sarah, if you get a chance, you can put that in the chat room. So if anyone wants to click on that and uh, get on her really informative and uh, inspirational, as we were talking about, uh, website. And, um, there's many more things to be said about Yvonne. She's going to tell you a little bit about her, probably about her website too. But uh, I met Yvonne through the Master Gardener program. I was one of those 1150 graduates. And I could tell you that her, her work and her uh, teaching inspired me to um, continue uh, following a career in urban farming and uh, environmental and food justice and really informs my work as a historian as well. And, my work at the Institute. So Yvonne, thank you so much for coming. I'm going to turn it over to you and we really appreciate your being here. 
Well, thanks so much, Nat. It's, it's wonderful to see one of my former students <laughs> do such good things in the world. So thank yes. you for pursuing all the right stuff. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Yvonne Savio, and I love chatting gardening. So one of the things I did when I uh, first retired was create my website, which is gardeninla.net, because it's lots of great information. Um, a couple of the things that you might like to subscribe uh, to it just by emailing me. There are job opportunities or will be job opportunities once this COVID whole thing uh, gets beyond and people would actually like to get together again and offer job opportunities. I do have a blog about my Pasadena garden that I put out about every other week or so. What's literally happening in the garden at that moment. Um, as opposed to my monthly tips, which are quite extensive, and they pretty much happen every year. Uh, but the blog really, the garden literally tells me what to talk about when I'm up taking photographs. Um, and just what's going on and what seems to be ahead of itself or behind itself or just what something I need to chat along with. And hopefully they'll make some of those connections with your experiences in your garden or help diffuse some of the mystery of it all and certainly um, reinforce the joyness of being out in the garden. Just feeling all those green leaves, especially now with that wonderful batches of rain that we had, uh, sporadic so that it had a chance to soak into the soil um, and now all the greenery is just going crazy. So I do have a couple things on the um, share screen for you here, if I can figure out which it is. Here. Now this is um, my container gardening write-up um, that I hope you will want to go ahead and print out um, because this is going to follow all of the uh, slides that I have and discussion about each of these points but I wanted you to be able to know that you that way don't have to take such an uh, extensive notes perhaps or you can just kind of listen to me talking about the whole thing so here it does have a graph about being able to know how deeply what kind of containers and how deeply and how many to grow in a container um, and covering a lot of different issues here so um, that's going to be available on screen for you and here is the link to my website and if you would like to email me um, and certainly to let me know that you want me to add you on to the mailing list. It's gardeninla at gmail.com. So the other item that I have for sharing with you that we're actually going to be dealing with is the, uh, why isn't this working right? Whoops, there we go. Well, no, I'm sorry. Let's see. May I interrupt for a second, yeah. Yvonne? Uh, I think it sounds like you may have some feedback. If you have two devices going at the same time, your one device hears the other device and your voice goes through both of them. So it amplifies them and makes that screeching sound. Is that well, possible? That screeching is a, um, is my, just my computer. Let me, um, Oh boy, I don't know where I am on this. Uh, let me turn down the volume and maybe that will... Can you still hear me okay? The screeching is just as loud and it seems to be coming in whenever you speak and not when you don't speak, which is what makes me think that it's audio feedback. I used to work in radio. It's the, yeah. that's, why it, it, that's what it sounds like to me anyway. Well, I just heard that it went um, much calmer 
Mm -hmm. And I don't have anything else running right here. So that seems a little bit better. It does, that yeah. Seems better yeah. now. Maybe if you could, however that is, just I think that's that's probably. Oh, I could hear it. Tolerable. Yeah. yeah. Oh, here we go okay. again. Oh, okay. sorry, everybody. All right. Now I need to. It doesn't like you now. Do you have like a phone or some other electronic device around your computer or laptop? Well, it it mm. is the computer that so it's oh. it's not something additional. You mean it makes that noise all the time even when you're not zooming? Oh yeah. That's oh, that's just what it does. <laughs> um okay, let me Sorry, I'm such a novel at this. Oh boy. Oh, there. Okay, so. I don't know why this. If you turn, if you, if you turn not on Zoom, but if you turn the sound all the way off on your computer, does the sound go away? Like when you're not Zooming? Because somebody suggested headphones, and that would work if, the, if it's just audio coming out of your computer rather than a mechanical sound coming from your computer. It does sound like a digital sound, not a mechanical sound to me. Well, I don't know. It, it's just the computer. Yeah. Um, oh, I see this is. Do you have headphones by chance? No. no. It only seems to be when you're speaking. Well, they're okay. I can I can hear when it goes up and down. Right now it's down, so it's just a function of the computer. So maybe if I make a point of speaking more loudly. I suspect if it's feedback that the speech will get louder too, but try it. Okay. Um, so this is the head shot on the um, the PowerPoint, and this has, you can see all these different uh, sizes of containers with different kinds of plants in them. And one of the things that you do need to consider is the size of the container for the particular plant that you're going to be growing. For example, a tomato here is going to need a much larger container than maybe some chives or even some strawberries here. So that's where the table on the handout is going to be of some help. Um, and we'll discuss the depths of things, but always in a container, you want to have the deepest possible container for whatever you're going to be planting. Because the nature of watering it is that it's going to go down and it's going to be cooler down at the bottom part of the container even though it might be evaporating from the top so the roots of the plant are automatically going to be growing further down into the container just in search of that water but also because it's going to be cooler down there the plant will be thriving more in a large container, always deeper than wider. For example, this kind of a container that's very decorative, it's very much wider than it is deeper, and that means that this is probably going to have to be watered. Certainly once we start getting our heat, it may have to be watered twice a day. Well, unless you have nothing else to do with your life, just let the plants have a, as large as deep a container as possible just in order so that you don't have to be out there all the time watering. So why should I grow in a container? There are advantages and disadvantages to everything of course. Um, if you have um, a patio or a balcony or on a fence or steps um, they basically can go anywhere, but it's a matter of matching the container with the place in terms of the sun and the air and the wind and the water and all the other things that we'll discuss. 
you can move containers by the season, either to follow or avoid direct sun. Um, you can move them for your own enjoyment. For example, when they're blooming or fruiting and you want to be able to see them uh, every time you come and go, then that's where they need to be. But then when they're not so interesting, um, perhaps you're moving them somewhere else where they're just spending their time just growing. And also you can create a special soil mix in a container, such as for blueberries or orchids that really do need a specialized mix. They don't do as well, or if at all, in uh, just generic potting mix. They really do need, like blueberries need the acidity and orchids need more like a bark situation. So some of the disadvantages are that these, these plants are captive. Those roots are restricted just to that container. So, and this is another reason to have as large a container as possible, certainly a deep one, um, because it does give the roots somewhere to go and to be able to become more extensive and healthy. Um, containers are sensitive to the weather um, they're literally right in the beating of it all, whether it's heat or cold or wind or whatever. You do need to irrigate them and fertilize them more frequently just because it is a captive root zone. And in probability, you will need to more frequently root prune it and repot it. This might be every single year. So, what type of a container? Um, you do want drainage holes uh, or because you want to be able to have the water flush out of it. But if you have a large decorative container like this one and perhaps it does not have holes in the bottom and you don't want to mess around with drilling a hole, then what you can do is put a pot in a pot that, for example, this rose here is planted in a five gallon pot that has drainage holes and it is set inside of this container that is larger than that. Now at the bottom of that container, if you can find some um, um, horticultural charcoal, which is what filters water, um, and also you can, then you set the pot that has the rose in it right on top of that so that the excess water that goes down and gathers at the bottom of the pot, you can either tilt or um, it will get filtered by that charcoal. The size of the pot um, and deeper than wider, um, I've kind of already discussed that just in terms of it's a larger area for the roots to be able to develop and consequently the plant is going to be happier and it's going to moderate the temperatures. Certainly if a pot like this one that is the dark color, it's going to um, absorb more heat if it's in the sun and having an interior pot that perhaps is, has the potting mix or sphagnum or something else in between the pot and the inner pot and the outer pot, then it's going to moderate the temperature and that plant won't be so beat with the heat. The materials um, and the color, um, the materials, this is like a ceramic, so it's going to absorb more of the warmth um, and the coolness. If it's just a plastic pot, it's going to be um, much more uh, the victim of whatever coolness and hotness. It's going to be shifting back and forth much more than the stability of a ceramic pot. And of course, hanging baskets are always fun. All these little teapots on here are all these shoes. Um, but hanging baskets, you automatically will have to spend more time 
looking after them, watering them, unless you choose, unless you choose plants that are going to be um, um, able to sustain the dryness and the heatness over a longer period of time, like succulents would be a good choice. Um, these particular ones are going to be more in a cooler climate or microclimate. And of course, you can always do this on your car, carry your garden with you. So this is a collection of my succulents that I had potted up years ago when I'm in the process of repotting them up now. But you see, you can just have great fun with um, the succulents uh, and how they're developing, giving them some space. <coughs> so how much sun do I give my plants? It really depends on the plant. Um, if you're growing the plant only for foliage, um, you know, it's just a green plant or colored or whatever, um, it needs six hours of sun a day just to um, keep the foliage healthy. If it's going to be growing flowers and fruit, you need that additional two plus hours every day because this is doing more than just growing the green foliage. It's making that extra step to put out flowers and then an even further development of developing the actual fruit on there getting it to the point that it's right in order for you to pick it. Now, bright shade is about where your house plants could go. Um, you're giving them a breather outside. Um, they don't wanna have any of that direct sun or else having it very filtered throughout the day when the sun is passing by. Soil mix is really going to be a, um, a point of probability, can possibly contention for um, problems. You don't want to use any real dirt from the garden because it's heavy. Uh, it has disease spores in there, probably, and probably weed seeds. Uh, but the heaviness is really the critical issue about um, a container because you just don't want to have but a solid mass in this container that these roots will have to be dealing with. You do want to use a high quality sterilized soilless mix of organic ingredients in there. Um, there's quite a few brands out there. My favorite one at this point is a, a brand called LGM. It's made in El Monte and it's in a bright yellow bag and it's available to me locally here at some of the independent nurseries. Um, this is bright yellow, but I'm just using this as a, a, a picture and not because I'm recommending this particular brand. Now, you do want to, um, one reason that I like that LGM is that it is fine grain like this. Um, it does not have big pieces of bark in it, though of course it has the organic matter to it. Um, I do want to fill my container, leaving about an inch, <laughs> an inch after um, a slight compression of it all. What I'll do at the bottom of my container with that hole at the bottom is I'll get a piece of window screening. Um, I just bought a whole roll of it that was a couple yards at um, Ace Hardware and I cut it in pieces that are about two and a half inches square. You put one of those on the hole and then you put a shard of a broken pot right on top of that. What this does is it allows the, their little bit of space 
between the shard and the bottom of the pot to allow excess water to drain out. But the screening is what keeps the potting mix in the pot because the little holes of the screening are too small for the pieces of the potting mix to go out. So once I fill the container with the potting mix, I um, transplant or put my seeds into it and then cover it with, in the case of seeds, maybe another quarter of an inch or so of the potting mix. And just so that at some point when I planted everything in there, whether it's the seedlings or the seeds, I still have this inch of space up on top because that is always going to be your watering space. You're going to fill this with water and it's going to sink down into the potting mix. So what can I plant? Here's a batch of veggies. This is that grow box, uh, which has this uh, pipe here entering to pour the the fertilizer mix into the container and it's more of a hydroponic kind of growth situation. Um, here's lemongrass in a container. Um, here is little baby peas. Um, this is the entire plant is only about eight inches tall and of course you don't get a whole lot of peas but certainly they're fresh and munchy nicely. In a small raised bed in a front yard grass area. Um, this is about six inches here. Um, you have dug up the soil underneath all that and added potting mix or more soil and then planted the individual plants. Here, um, this is at a uh, community garden um, a couple of leeks planted in the brick wall and because the leeks do fine with the tremendous heat um, and they just need a, a limited amount of space to grow but they go straight down so that works well. Here's a whole bunch of lettuce. It starts out with the water and a pump in a big watering trough here. It goes up here at the pipe to the rain gutter that is planted with lettuce. The tilt makes it so it goes down and then down and down, all the way down to the bottom, and then it dumps back into the bucket. So it's definitely a worthwhile way of reutilizing your water. And of course, you get all that lettuce as well. Hey, Vaughn, sorry to interrupt. Just yes. a quick question. Um, the last slide, oh, someone had asked about um, um, how uh, not putting too much soil all the way to, uh, to the top. And she wanted to know um, how much room do you want to leave an inch for, for about water? About an inch. About an inch. Okay. You know, when you first fill the container, you'll fill it up to the top. But then as you compress the soil because you're planting um, seedlings in there or a couple of seeds, it's going to, you're kind of pressing it just with your fingers, you know, just your fingertips um, so that you're, you're compressing the soil a little bit and then once you water it the first time, it will sink down to about leaving that one inch. Great. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So fruit trees, fruit bushes, and ornamental trees. Um, here's a big container that has a grape in it that was growing here before all this construction went in. This is a nice exercise mat area at the uh, Proyecto Jardin Communal Garden in Boyle Heights. And they had this uh, grape growing before them and now, just because of the orientation of the sun, this plant is just barely getting some direct sun up here 
So it's going to be a nice green plant, but it probably will not be bearing many grapes because as we said earlier, the, um, in order for flowers and fruit, it needs to have the additional time of eight hours or more of direct sun. Now this container that has a kumquat tree planted in it, it also has all of this little succulent kinds of plants at the very base, which take advantage of the moisture in the container um, just right at the surface because these succulents, maybe their roots are only two, three inches deep, whereas the tree really wants to be able to access the entire container worth of the roots. So it's not a competition issue because the um, succulent roots are just at the very top of the container and the container is fully um, as a resource for the kumquat tree. Now in this kind of a container, this is really a minimal situation, but apparently the tree has adapted somewhat. Um, it's still green and full of foliage, so it's making do as best it can. So flowers, we've got begonias, geraniums, even tulip bulbs, hydrangeas, um, mini roses, and even some bromeliads. I love this as her hairdo. Now these hydrangeas are on the north uh, side and it does get some sun, uh, but only in the morning because the late afternoon sun is what would really wreak havoc with the hydrangeas. So how many plants in a pot? Now this container is probably 20 inches across. You know, if you put your, your hands wide open like this and you put the two together, that's probably about as wide as the pot is. So it's a lot of space and depth wise, it's probably two and a half times that. So we have one artichoke that is perennial. It will come back year after year after year. Um, or put up new shoots off to the side, which will bear the artichokes. But we've also got several kinds of basils. Here's one, here's a, uh, the opal basil. So this might be the opal and the dark, uh, purple, and some oregano and some other herbs. There's some other stuff back here. Just like with that uh, kumquat with the succulents, the artichoke is going to utilize all the bottom part of this container for its extensive roots, whereas all these things that are planted right around the edge are only going to be about maybe four or five inches um, in depth. So their root system. So they're not going to be competing with the artichoke. So everybody is going to be happy in this situation. Quick question, Yvonne. Yeah. Um, as you're, that's beautiful, by the way. Uh, so I had asked about, you mentioned bright shade. What does that exactly mean? And um, someone had asked, um, there's a space that they have identified to plant, but it's entirely shaded. Uh, is, there, is there anything that would work in a space like that? Yeah, it's, it's always hard to gauge um, what bright and shade. It's like a contradiction in terms. But what it means is that um, it's, a lot of light relative to being underneath a bush, but there's no direct sun. That's what bright shade is. And filtered light may mean that it, it has like a, it's under a tree or a bush that as the sun 
moves through the day, um, there are maybe 10 minutes at a time, we'll have little speckles of light on the foliage of the plant, but it keeps moving so that it's not um, in direct sun all of the time. Now a low light situation would be um, sometimes the begonias um, can be in a bright light. They can even take some of that filtered sun, um, but some of them, different varieties can um, be with lesser light. Um, like all of these plants really would want as much direct sun as possible. Um, if these same plants were in a bright shade situation, they would start to get lanky and kind of grow out um, so that it would not be a really tight, compact plant um, because it's literally reaching out to the sun. And that will be a cue for you um, if you've put a plant in a place that is too much sun, you'll start seeing that the leaves are going to start looking a little burnt. Um, and if there's not enough light, that the plant will kind of be leaning toward um, the light. So that'll, the plant will start to kind of tell you what's going on. Thanks. Is that, is that helpful? Uh, I think so. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I, since I got you here, though, really quick, and before you jump to the next slide, it, there's a thousand good questions here, um, so specific about, well, one is a kind of a, not re directly related, but someone asked, how long is a, maybe you could ask this, answer this question last, how long is grasshopper season in the California, particularly the Riverside area? And then also, um, what do you do if you have uh, the rolling the polies, the pill bugs in, the container, in your containers. Um, do you try to eradicate them or let them, you know, take a bit of your harvest? Yeah, um, grasshoppers are early spring, so it's now, and there are several generations. So if you can't manage to smash them now, um, two, three weeks, there'll be another batch of them. Um, <clears throat> One thing you can do is, um, and, and roly-polies are um, like earwigs, they're only interested in the dead matter. So it's, it's, they may be around where your plants are actively growing, but they're only there for the dead stuff. Um, now, one uh, recommendation would be that you go on to an excellent resource is the Integrated Pest Management website of the University of California. So if you, um, I always get confused with it's ucipm.ucdavis, because that's where it is located, but it's, of course, system-wide. Um, or you can just Google University of California integrated pest management um maybe i'll put Sarah, that i'll put that link there I'll put that link up. yeah sure um and there is uh you click on the one that talks about home gardening because it does commercial and agriculture and all that stuff as well and then in the upper right hand corner there will be a little directory that says pest notes and that is like the um, the short version that has all information about what uh, the problem is, how it gets worse, and what you can do about it. So the pest notes is especially what I would recommend people be able to access there. Okay, um, seeds or transplants. Um, you really want, because you're working in a container and you um, have more immediate access to it, uh, just because it's right outside your door or somewhere where you're um, going to pay close attention to it, you can grow seeds that germinate more quickly. 
and also transplants um, that are going to give you a lot of food um, and flowers, if that's what you prefer, um, to the, the effort that you put into it. Now, um, high yield vegetables are beans, beets, broccoli, carrots, lettuce, peppers, radishes, squashes, and tomatoes. All these ones that I've uh, got pictures of down here. Because in a container, because you're paying close attention to it, you just want to make sure that you're kind of getting a good amount of feedback um, or feed, food, um, from the effort that you're putting into it. So uh, in a sense, you don't want, like, for example, tomatoes. I would not start them by seeds. I would use the tomato small plants, like in a six pack or a four inch container is going to be ideal for most vegetables. They will be developed sufficiently um, that they can just take off in your uh, container, but you don't have to wait around forever for them to grow to that point um, that you could buy them at big box stores and nurseries and um, anywhere that they're available now. And now is a great time, and we do have many of the local nurseries that are um, providing the, although you can't go there and go through, um, apparently the, you can order online and then go pick them up. And there's quite a few nurseries that are um, availing everyone of that, because certainly this is the, the perfect time for getting your gardens going now. So how frequently do I water? The larger, deeper containers um, moderate the soil temperature um, so that the soil won't be heated up and then cooled down. And consequently, the roots really will have a much better access to the moisture and the fertilizer and they won't be so shocked about having to deal with this uh, changing temperatures all the time. The double potting um, moderates them even more. As I had suggested with the uh, rose and that big blue pot, that you put a pot in a pot and line it either with more potting mix or with um, whatever in between the two pots that will offer more insulation. Use your finger as a measure, um, just literally uh, pushing your finger down into the soil, down to the, say, the second um, knuckle. And if it's moist down there, you don't need to water it. If it's dry down that deep, then you'd probably need to water it. And do water slowly, because if it's been a while since you watered and the potting mix has kind of dried in place, um, it will have pulled away from the side of the container. And if you just dump a batch of water in there, um, it's going to run to the side and then run down the outside of the inside pot and just out the exit there instead of moistening all the tremendous um, potting mix and root zone inside. Now, <clears throat> um, a drip pan, I recommend using that during the summer because the water as it runs through the pot will then gather in the drip pan and this will reabsorb that amount of water, which should only be like at maximum an inch or so, um, up back into the pot as the potting mix needs it. Now winter is not a good time to use a drip pan just because it will literally sit in that drip pan and uh, rot out the whole bottom part of the root zone. Now this manner of planting um, where you're using progressively smaller containers for the next set of vegetables or herbs in this case. Um, this is a good idea because 
the water that goes out from this pan, it drips down into this one, and then the excess goes down into the bottom one. So it keeps everybody watered more happy. How frequently do I fertilize? Well, the major nutrients are nitrogen, which provides the green foliage, phosphorus, which is more for strong roots, and potassium, which is more of the general health of the entire plant. So those are the major numbers of like 555 or 10, 10, 10, whatever the number combination is on the package as you see it <coughs> in the store. But there's also trace nutrients, which are really important to avail for the plant. Um, and organic fertilizers include fish emulsion, seaweed, kelp, blood meal, and bone meal. And those are many times mixed in to good um, potting mixes and in fertilizers. Now I recommend that you water every time or every other time you water, you utilize a quarter strength of the fertilizer. The whole point here is to gradually keep the fertilizer in the potting mix by virtue of watering it every time so that when the roots determine that they need more of that fertilizer, it's there ready for them to pick it up. And consequently, it's not a one time a month or whatever the schedule is where it says that you should be um, uh, fertilizing your plant. Um, I much prefer to have lesser fertilizer every other time or even every time you water a very um, diluted version of it. Now remember in watering, um, when you're fertilizing, you want to water first and then add the fertilizer to it. Because um, the fertilizer, if, even in Don, a- Don, do you want to do that every time? Oh. Pardon me? Oh, sorry to interrupt. I just someone asked, do you want to do that every other time? Someone said, do you recommend um, uh, this every other time, the water fertilizing for raised right. beds or just- Right. Okay. But when you okay. do, uh, when you are going to be watering it with the fertilizer, put straight water in first because that will moisten all of the potting mix and then water with the fertilizer in it. What you are trying to avoid is putting this fertilizer um, straight into a dry uh, potting mix uh, because that potentially will burn the roots even if you do a very dilute version of it. You want this, the whole soil mix profile, the entire clump of the soil mix to be moist when you put in the fertilizer. Great, thank you. Okay. I got more questions, but I'll let you keep going a little bit more. Okay. Everyone's, everyone's very that's, excited and has lots of chat questions, but please continue. Okay, that's basically it. From here on, I just have a batch of really fun containers that um, you can think about uh, adapting, like a coffee pot. And so let me just scroll through some of these. I love this one, taking your garden with you. These are all shoes. 
And this is, of course, I think all of our fantasies about what our container garden should look like. So that's it. So any other questions? No, we can open it for questions if people want to unmute themselves and ask a question or type it in the chat box and I can read your question. Someone asked a question, are there any tips for growing black currant in Southern California? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I've never considered growing it. <laughs> so maybe that's a, a clue right there. Not necessarily. There's all sorts of stuff that I've not grown. but. Do you have any tips for easy, low-maintenance vegetables that can be grown? Well, all of those ones that I had that were the, you know, the beans and the tomatoes and all those are really, um, where did I have that list? Here, uh, the beans, beets, broccoli, carrots, lettuces, peppers, radishes, squashes, and tomatoes. Those are the ones that give you the most food for the amount of effort you're putting in. Um, uh, carrots are somewhat difficult, especially since we're moving into our hot period, apparently. Um, carrots might be a bit difficult to start from seed because they generally take up to three weeks um, in their germinating bed before they actually germinate. Um, and with the heat that um, will be crusting the top soil and they're not so um, adept at that because carrot seeds are not as strong as other things in able to push apart the clumping soil in order to germinate. Uh, but beans and beets, um, those are good sized uh, seeds that are easy to um, plant directly and water a couple times and they'll come up within a week or so. Um, you want to, uh, the lettuce, um, at this point, you should be looking for varieties that say bolt prone or not bolt prone uh, or drought tolerant because as we move into the hotter season, they're going to have more difficulty germinating but also remaining nice and tender um, in order to be able to harvest them. Uh, peppers, both belk type sweet peppers and chili peppers. Um, plants are the best way to go. Um, squash are easy to start from seed. And of course, these are the yellow zucchini, uh, but the, I love the crookneck squash. Uh, and also the green zucchini and the scallopini and all the different shapes. Those are very easy and it is a big seed. It's easy to um, start. Tomatoes, certainly I would buy the plants. Um, usually in past years, we've had the advantage of tomato mania um, at several different locations. And we did have the first two of them this year before the COVID kind of closed all of those gatherings down. Um, but several um, of the different nurseries around me are um, carrying those varieties. And even the big box stores are, I, I understand that Home Depot is still open where you can walk around in the stores. Um, and they do have quite a few different varieties. Um, and certainly like Armstrong's as a chain uh, that has many stores and all the independents, um, most of them do have the availability of being able to order online and then going and picking up your plants. So um, always you should 
um, grow things that you know your family enjoys. Because certainly now, you know, we're all kind of freaking out with just having to be at such close quarters and staying indoors and the whole thing. It's wonderful to be able to, in my case, have this large garden that I do to be able to go out and play in the dirt. Um, and growing the plants is really a, a wonderful um, salve to our psychological health as well as literally giving us food to eat. So I certainly hope that you can manage to do whatever you can to get your fingers in the mud. <coughs> yeah, we have time well, for a few more questions. Oh. Um, let's see, I'm just going down the list in the chat. Kathleen was asking, have you ever grown loofah from a pot? Um, no, I haven't. I know some of our master gardeners have brought them in um, the loofah when it was done, you know, and, uh, and I did have one that had seeds. It's quite a large seed, maybe the size of your fingernail. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> um, so I assume it would grow nicely, but I, I don't really know what the pattern is of the growth. I don't know if you need a trellis or it makes a, a clump of a plant. I don't know. <coughs> um, do you know what the quickest way or how would you recommend the quickest way to germinate seeds is? Um, I'm kind of hesitating because you, you just plant them and water them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what the, you know, aside from things like carrots that are going to take so long, um, a little bit of a, you know, either in a, a four inch container or um, a shallow, maybe two, three inches deep. <coughs> Um, that you scatter the seed on there and then scatter just a little bit of the potting mix. You don't want to really, you just want to anchor the seed in that potting mix. You don't want to cover it because the many seeds, especially the smaller they are, they need light to germinate. So you want it just to kind of anchor it in place. Yeah. Well, um... I think with that, Ivana, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me here? Yeah. Okay, great. We re we've reached our hour. I mean, there's so many, there are actually so many more questions, um, but maybe we'll have to, we'll have to come back, have you back. Um, and then hopefully we'll have you back in person on campus when we when we get to the other side of this uh, curve, this Corona curve. And um, we really, really appreciate such beautiful slides and for your time and, and all this encyclopedic. I think that was, mentioned several times in the, in the chat room, Yvonne's encyclopedic knowledge. So we really appreciate I've, that. I've, as the master uh -huh. gardeners have uh -huh. said, when they marvel about how much I know and how much I can <laughs> chatter on about things, I've killed more plants <laughs> than you guys have ever thought about growing. And that's yeah. how I learn. That's it, right. it really, sometimes it's what you do wrong and how something fails that makes you want to figure out, well, what can I do differently next time in order to make it hopefully work? So it. it's just a matter of experience. So right. please don't get down on yourself when something yeah. doesn't work. Just try it a different way and try it again. Yeah. And Yvonne, do, that a, do let sorry. me know. You know, I'd love to, to hear from you and with your particular questions and hopefully I can be of some help in getting you um, to feel a little more comfortable and familiar with getting things started. Definitely, Vaughn. Well, thank you so much for your time and thank you everyone for coming and uh, apologies for the, uh, some of the technical snafus, but we made it through and uh, just an incredible amount of great information. We're gonna have the slides and uh, some recording available for everybody as well. So thanks so much, Yvonne. Great, thank and, you. And we'll see you soon. Thank All you. Bye-bye, right. okay. right, everybody. Now everybody go back out in the garden. That's it, exactly. Bye-bye. <laughs> Happy Earth Day. Absolutely. Yes. Perfect Happy timing.